This is my last day at home. I'm not sure tomorrow I will be dead or alive. Adam girmiş hayatına emce, dünkü emce şimdi diyordu babana ben seni. Ne Hello, welcome to this BFI at home event and women with a movie camera Q&A. My name is Leila Latif. I'm a film critic and journalist. And tonight I'm thrilled to be joined by the acclaimed documentary filmmaker Eva Mulbard to talk about her powerful new film, Love Child. Just a note for the audience, uh, my name is Layla and the subject of the film is also called Layla. Hopefully who we are referring to in the discussion will be clear based on context, but apologies if that ever gets confusing. So before we get into the specifics of Love Child, I have to ask you, Eva, your documentary has have had such a huge range of subjects. Um, you've done uh, the first Afghan woman to ever enter parliament, producers of cherry wine, a richest a rag story about a Danish family in Portugal. What is it that you look for in a subject? Well, for me, it's not so much the subject as the potential of actually following real events uh, throughout a longer period of time and some kind of attraction to certain characters or environments. Because um, I, I, I really love this uh, cinema verite style of uh, documentary where you follow people through their um, real life and um, stay with them in ups and downs. And that way you kind of um, create a, a rich material like you know it from fiction films where you kind of you are with the, the characters uh, through uh, a lot of stuff that teach you um, what they go through, but also how they handle their their individual lives. So I basically look for something that could be interesting, uh, and and I think you bet on some some people, and you see what life does to them. Um, and sometimes it it's a lot of great material comes out of that, and other times you have to struggle to find the story. But uh, it, that's more the kind of format that I'm looking for than any specific topic. When it came to Love Child in particular, this is um, such a kind of unpredictable story. Um, how did it, this story come to you? Yeah, um, I was looking for, or I had in my mind, um, I'd been doing a, a refugee story before and um, in 2012, we knew that there would there were a lot of refugees in the world and um, it wasn't as bad as we saw uh, three years later in 15 when we had the big crisis but we knew that the refugee issue had been present for for a while and I was presented by another Danish filmmaker for the he had filmed the beginning of this story that now is called Love Child <clears throat> and he knew the family he met them in um, in Iran before they escaped and he had kept contact with the father 
um, if you've seen the film, the father has been like a small fish spy in, um, in, for the Iranian uh, intelligence service. And one of his jobs was to uh, talk with people because he spoke English in the bazaar and, and chat up tourists and like kind of check out what they were doing there. And one of those he chatted up, that was this guy called Morton, who is the co-director of this film. So he, when the family wanted to escape from Iran, they felt uh, that it would secure their situation if somebody followed them. So they called different medias and one of them was this guy Morton and he kind of grabbed the idea and he went to Turkey and followed them for the first days when they came out of Iran and shot some really good uh, scenes with them there. So he was not able to finance uh, the film. He's not as, as, as uh, experienced uh, in long-term documentary cinema. So um, he came to our production company and asked if any of us could um, be interested in, in working with him on the project. And so that was the way I, I got involved in it. So did what he come to you, so he came to you with essentially what is the first scene of the film? Yeah, he came uh, with a bunch of material. It had a lot of direction, but that's like yeah. uh, what, what documentary material looks like in the beginning, mm -hmm. you try different things out. But especially um, one scene that's also in the film now really touched me. And that was a scene with a, with a little boy crying because um, the story is basically a love story and, and the boy does not know. It's a mother, father and a almost five year old boy and they leave Iran and the boy doesn't know that it's really an escape and they will not come back. And he doesn't know that the guy traveling with them is not just his uncle or relative, but, but his biological father. So um, there's a scene in the material that I was presented for that where he really reacts to the fact that now this is his reality and, and he's not gonna see his grandparents again soon and his life has changed and, and the, the uncle has turned him to be his real father. So that scene was very powerful. He's such a endearing, lovely little boy. I mean, one of the really joyful things I took from the film was kind of seeing him blossom and come into himself and like the happiness that he found um, in Turkey. But when you're working with, uh, you know, a child, sub, you know, central to this subject matter, do you then have to create like structures and boundaries around what you are going to kind of subject him to and how much you're going to expose about him in particular? Well, I, I work very close with the parents on this. Um, um, and they were first and foremost his guidance. I mean, in the beginning, English, so it was very difficult for me to talk to him directly um, because he was small and, and we didn't share any language. So I was very dependent on the, the parents to take those uh, choices for him. And um, it, when he turned older and we had a more, um, more language, um, we could discuss what he wanted to be part of and what he didn't want to be part of. But I think what was more in difficult for him was uh, the uncertainty of the life that they went through than the fact that he was filmed. Uh, and we have had uh, conversations with his parents about how to use the material and, and they have accepted before we screened the film the way that it's used. Yeah. Um, I just really, I mean, going back to the opening scene, like one of the things that I really stood out to me about this film is this kind of amazing suspense that you build up because you open with this kind of hysterically crying man saying that he may be dead tomorrow. And then you really take your time to like tease out what it is that they're running from, what it is that they're afraid of. Like, like was that a purposeful structure to kind of inject a bit of a mystery into this? Um, no, not really. I mean, in documentary films, we have uh, less opportunity to plan uh, everything. Um, so we had a lot of different storylines that we were working with. And in the beginning, um, we thought that we would start a little bit differently. And, and um, the material in the beginning is also, it's, it wasn't shot exactly uh, like uh, with all the nuances that you would like to have because they were, Morden, my co-director was not able to go to film all the time. So we had like something from the beginning and then we had to piece things together that was more or less shot with the, the family's own cell phones and like from the building of their house and, and stuff like that. So it, 
and they also filmed the beginning where where he's saying that he's tomorrow the family uh owned by himself on his own cell phone in iran so we had to play with different medias and different um um yeah scenes that to, to kind of uh, puzzle piece it together and make uh, you understand that there was something happening in the past but to tell the full story from the beginning was not possible we needed to kind of mix it into to um, a certain kind of real life um, scenic uh, storytelling structure so that it would fit together with the rest of the film and you're with this family documenting their lives for six years is that right mm -hmm. Did you feel as refugees that over that six years, the world became like more hostile towards refugees? Yes, um, we were a team of three directors and one local DOP, a Turkish woman. And uh, we came and visited the family uh, very often for some years, very often, other years, not so often. And we tried to um, um, follow the the case that they had uh, applying for asylum with the UNHCR so every time something happened uh, in that case we went um, and filmed and uh, we felt it was very clear that uh, the local Turkish people that th this family were living in the, out the outskirts of, Europe, of Istanbul and the local uh, people around them they were very very nice and very gentle and friendly and helpful to the family but it was also clear that the that the Turkish society over the years that we filmed uh, got more and more pressure from the amount of refugees coming, especially from the war in Syria, and um, at the, that mixed with a uh, level of, of uh, collapsing economy and stuff like that, definitely made uh, the environment around being a refugee in Turkey um, more difficult. And then we saw all of these populistic leaders. Uh, Trump in the, in America especially, but also other leaders uh, in Europe, uh, different places, uh, using the refugee crisis as uh, kind of a, a thing that could fuel their own domestic political uh, ambitions. Yeah, no, it is. I think though this film was kind of made suddenly more profound for me being in the UK, watching it at a time where kind of it's all about securing the borders and it's all about um, keeping people out and dehumanizing the people that are just trying to you know live their lives safely um i ended up kind of feeling quite conflicted about the unhcr by the end of this film like did did you change how you felt about them yeah but i think it's important that we all try to understand that i mean I'm raised with the fact that the UN is, we are the good guys, the Western world and yeah. the UN, that's a good guys, right? And you have this uh, wonderful global organization and they really do a lot of good. I, I guess they do a lot of good because they are so engaged in so many really um, important political issues around the world. But it's also a very unrealistic system somehow that we kind of, um, let these people handle all of the problems with but how can they handle like resettling a lot of refugees if no countries really want to open their borders to them um so i guess that a lot of this can end up being a really weird paper struggle um that nobody can really solve any issues and nobody can place the responsibility anywhere um, and then it becomes a very Kafka-like, uh, faceless, yeah. bureaucratic system that uh, you don't know what is important for your case to be taken serious. Uh, you don't know what you said wrong or right. Um, you don't know who is deciding uh, really important destiny issues for you. And, and what is most frustrating for many of the people waiting for these kind of answers that they can do nothing about it. It's out of their hands and their destiny is just uh, something that is decided by other people. And it's super difficult. I, and I'm not pointing like a finger saying that the UN HCR in this uh, film, in the case of this film, is doing things bad. But I guess in a big system like that, there will be good and bad things happening. And uh, it's also very depending on, on the countries supporting the system uh, in which way they do so. 
Yeah, but you really feel over the course of the film, like the burden of living your life in limbo on these people as if, you know, you were obviously very connected to them. As a filmmaker, did you also feel the kind of pressure of that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, in the beginning, we, uh, I was very, very impressed with how good this particular family is to handle a very difficult mm. situation. And I mean, for them, they speak English, they're educated, they don't come out of a traumatic um, war. They come uh, from a middle class background and they, um, I mean, they, they have resources, they have money in their pockets. Um, and for them, it's so super difficult. And how would it be for somebody with less resources? I can't imagine. Um, and and what is so difficult uh, for for most is uh, the unknown um, future, and um, and your your lack of of impact on your own destiny. And I mean that, of course, was very very um, direct in our face uh, all the time when we were filming there because it it took different turns and twists and. We definitely didn't expect it to, to take so many years. And, and actually their case is still unsolved. They don't know, they don't have any basic rights where they are now, as long as they have jobs, they, mm. uh, they can still um, have some kind of decent life. But the Corona uh, situation in Turkey is super difficult and people cannot go to school. Uh, it's private schools, they're not paid when uh, the students don't pay, the, the teachers are not paid, I mean, um, we can talk about all of us being in a situation that we didn't choose and having to face a lot of difficulties, but for those who already had difficulties with just basic rights and, and security and stuff like that, this crisis on top of, of all the other uh, things that has happened to them is, is, is uh, way more deep uh, in terms of, of uh, impact, negative impact. God, I'm sure. It is interesting, though, that this is this is a type of refugee um, in Leyland Shahan that is not what you kind of typically would picture this middle class refugee. And but it seems to still be an unwinnable situation, because as much as in the West, there's an idea about like, oh, this is what we want. We want highly educated, multilingual um, people to come over. There was a real outrage in the UK a couple of years ago when uh, there were photos of the Syrian refugees who had smartphones because that meant that they weren't desperate enough or they weren't deserving enough. So really there is, it's kind of an unwinnable um, situation, I think, sadly. Um, I don't yeah, know. that was also a point. Yeah, that was a point that we, we discussed it a lot uh, in the beginning, uh, saying like, hey, are we allowed to do a film about refugees, like luxury refugees in a way? Mm. Uh, because there's so many dramatic stories out there. Um, and these guys, I mean, they have a super dramatic story, but they are also like you and me in a way, they had choices and they were not forced to flee and they didn't lose um, any legs or or relatives uh, in a war, stuff like that. So, uh, but I think it's important that this film is first and foremost a love story. And to me, it's important to try and, and um, not put the theme all the way up there all the time saying mm -hmm. that behind all of these numbers and figures that we can read in the press, there are a lot of human stories. And it's just a very banal fact that that's it, but we often forget it. And last time I checked, it was like around 60 million refugees in the world totally. And all of these refugees, they are not like one, one of a kind. They are as diverse as the rest of us. Um, some, some come out of war and poverty. And of course they have a very hard situation, but they are also replaced uh, people who cannot live in there where they used to live um, around the world. And there are people like Sahan and Leila who cannot live in the culture that they, they want to live in and raised in um, because they took some choices that challenged uh, that culture too much. And then it becomes difficult and dangerous for them to, to stay. So we, I think it's important to kind of, it's, it's very banal, but stay human, stay, stick to the humanity of these uh, issues. Because um, I think we, when we try to tell ourselves that these people, they don't need protection and they just come here to benefit from the welfare systems and stuff like that. I mean, 
of course there will be people like that among all of the millions and millions mm. but i guess that most of most people will never leave what they have uh, if they were not somehow do so because it's such a unsecure journey and it's uh, it's so difficult to to establish yourself and and really build um, any kind of of uh, ordinary life mm. It's interesting because though you say that these are kind of not the traumatized refugees fleeing a war zone, they are both kind of dealing with particular guilt, it seems to be more mm. than anything. And what it seems like Sahand is very keen to like absolve himself, whilst Layla really is very burdened by this sense of the damage she's done and that she's left behind. Um, was that kind of conflict evident from the beginning? Uh, that's something that you kind of try to find out throughout the the, the shootings that what mm. what drives them and what what can we see what kind of emotions and and will and demons do they have that we can relate to and i think for both of them it was very um clear that we are that they 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 are longing for a normal life and then they and especially leila is is super traumatized by what she did to her family and and the, the longing for being close with them which she's not able to um so and, and they had kind of different wills in a way like Leila mm -hmm. just wanted to secure her family and and had a very simple quest whereas Sahan had a more um he he was more he is more political and he he wanted yeah. to clean himself from the mess that he was brought into uh, back in Iran and that he felt guilty about. So um, and sometimes the Sahan's goals for for cleaning up the mess uh, and and taking brave choices politically uh, got the two of them into fights about what would be the right thing to do for the family at that certain moment. So that is, of course, also interesting as a as a filmmaker to to find um, enough of that material so that you can put yourself in their shoes and understand how they see the world and and start to to maybe think about what they come out of and 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 to relate to them really and to I mean to me it was interesting to see their uh, relationship because they are they were not able to live together in Iran because they had this uh outside of marriage uh, affair yeah and um so when they came out of of turkey they had never they had a, a five-year-old kid but they didn't share a common experience of, of ha being a family or living together yeah and that um that process of, of building a relationship and taking the discussions and i mean to me that's a lovely part of the film because it's such a I mean, it's the same things that we have, the same kind of discussions here. Um, so you can really relate to that male-female kind of uh, quarrel and how how um, how that looks. And it doesn't matter if you're a refugee or not. That's a kind of a common language that happens in a lot of families around the world uh, when you have to adapt to each other and find the way of, of compromising or being um, supportive, whatever. Yeah, it is. A, I mean, you really, from very, very early on, have such a strong sense about how much these two love each other. And even in the moments where um, you're filming like them screaming at one another, they're never cruel. And you, you never kind of have a sense that this is a dysfunctional relationship that's going to, that might not make it at all. No, it's quite inspiring to see how, I mean, they had to take a very ultimate choice they had to choose between their life and each other in a way. Mm. So they couldn't get both. And in a way we are, I mean, in, in our societies, we get divorced uh, so much, so so often it happens. Mm. And it can be, to me, it was a big inspiration, this kind of, you choose something and you stick to it and you try, try to make it work, which they're very good at. Um, and they are really all in, um, even they have problems, they, they really, um, I mean, they, they kind of just know that they have to stay together because that's the, how they're, how much they went through to be together. They can't afford uh, opening the door of, of a divorce, for example. 
and I also feel that they really love each other. It's not like it's the case, but it, I think it's it also comes out of what they they've been through together. Oh, um, yeah. Um, so I might leave it on uh, this final question of when you are following a story like this for six years, how do you feel you got a sense that this it reached a conclusion? That you know that this was the arc had been covered. Like when do you when do you know that the story and the film stops? Well, with documentary, um, it's it's never really easy to say. Uh, but sometimes, and also in this case, um, it felt like whenever we came back to the family, that it was more or less uh, repetitive. Uh, that there was not new things happening and. And we, in the beginning, we thought that we would make a story that would end with them being resettled somewhere in the world and we could leave them there for starting their new life. But it seemed to be impossible because the world does not really welcome many quota refugees these days. Mm -hmm. And these guys are very strong, they have jobs and, and the UNHCR has to replace the most vulnerable first. So basically they are stuck in Turkey without rights. And so we felt that we could end it when the maybe when the story of, of Sahan, the, the father and his um, his kind of answer from the UN that had been um, a very hard struggle for him to get that answer that he wanted. So um, in a way, we tried to, to wrap it up uh, with the UN case coming to some kind of finalization and, and end. So, um, so the feeling you have is that if, if something keeps on being in motion and take new twists mm. and turns, of course their life does that. But your story, you have to kind of find out what it, what drives your story, what is the motor. And and we could have filmed, of course, for many more years. But I don't see I don't see that that would have brought um, really new perspectives to this. So we felt that we had kind of a feeling of a closure to the mm. story. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Um, we have unfortunately now come to the end of our conversation with Eva Movad. Eva, thank you so much for your time and your insight into this wonderful film. Thank you. You can watch Love Child on BFI Player now. If you enjoyed this event, please subscribe to the BFI YouTube channel and consider donating to the BFI. They are a charity and their venues are currently closed due to lockdown, so your support helps keep them going. Thanks for watching. Good night.